Hi everyone, uh, my name is Raciel. I'm an engineer in leading in TensorFlow Lite. And today I will be covering a lot of the work that the team has done over the past year to bring you features that you can take advantage of uh, right away. And hopefully you are already doing that. I will also cover a lot of the work that we have for this year. Um, but before we, we jump into, into that, uh, let me give you a brief introduction of what TensorFlow Lite is. So TensorFlow Lite is our infrastructure framework to run machine learning on device. Um, and the reason why we decided to build TensorFlow Lite was because machine learning, uh, you typically think of it as running on the server, right? But more and more is moving to edge devices, like mobile devices, cars, um, wearables, you name it. So there is more uh, machine learning moving to different kinds of devices. And there is good reasons for that. Um, one, you have access to a lot more data. Uh, because you, you have access to the audio, to the camera, and you don't have to stream it all the way to the server. So you can, you can do a lot of stuff. You can do sensor fusion, and that means that you can build uh, faster and close-knit interactions. Uh, another advantage of running uh, machine learning on device is that it has a strong uh, privacy-preserving component, right? Because the data stays on device. It doesn't necessarily have to go to the server. Um, however, um, uh, well, that means that uh, basically by building machine learning on device, by allowing that, we can build products that otherwise wouldn't be able really to, to work uh, if you really rely only on server-side execution. Uh, however, uh, you know, it, it is hard. Um, perhaps one obvious thing is that you don't have the same compute power that you have on the server, right? So if you have a new, very cool, shiny machine learning model that um, consumes too much uh, compute power, it's not like in the server that you can you know, throw perhaps more, more servers at it and that be done with it. You have to be mindful of the resources that you have in the device. Another of those resources is the memory. So you have restricted memory, so you have to be careful about how you craft your model, perhaps try some uh, compression techniques. And last but not least, many of these devices are battery powered, right? So even if you have a model that fits in memory that can execute, um, well, you don't want to consume all the, all the battery in a battery power uh, device. So for all these reasons that what we build uh, TensorFlow Lite, we want to make deploying machine learning uh, on edge devices as easily as possible. And what can you do with it right now? Well, you can do a lot of things. Uh, these, are, these are different tasks that are supported by TensorFlow Lite already. And if you look at it, uh, when you hear machine learning, you typically fall into one of these tasks. Um, you know, text, speech, image processing, audio processing, a lot of content uh, generation. So you really, like, uh, everything is already uh, there for you to take advantage of. And because we already are able to support all these tasks, it means that it has a lot of usage already. So TensorFlow Lite is currently deployed in over 2 billion devices in production. Uh, and this not only means uh, Google properties, uh, and some of which are really core to Google, like the Assistant, Google Photos, but also uh, uh, from other companies, from other large companies, um, and also frameworks. Uh, so a lot, of our, a lot of our infrastructure is powering frameworks like AutoML and MLKit. And I can, I can tell you uh, many reasons why uh, it's, it's a good idea to use our infrastructure, but we thought that it would be best if we bring two of our important clients to tell you how they use TensorFlow Lite and why they decided to use it. Our first, uh, our first presenter is Alex. Uh, he's coming from the Google Assistant, and the Google Assistant I mean, it has a wide variety of devices where it's running. Um, so let's hear from here why they are using TensorFlow Lite and how they are doing. Thanks, Raziel. So I'm Alex. Uh, I'm the engineering lead on our embedded speech recognition team at Google. So one of the key applications for speech recognition at Google is the Google Assistant. Uh, Google recently announced that the Google Assistant is on about a billion devices, uh, ranging from phones, speakers, smart displays, cars, TVs, laptops, wearables. You name it, we're trying to put the Assistant into it. Uh, from my perspective, that means a wide range of devices. High-end devices, low-end devices, ARM, x86, battery-powered, plugged in, a wide range of operating systems. So basically, the neural nets that I build have to be able to run anywhere. 
Um, for Assistant, we have a couple of key speech on device capabilities. The first is the hot word. Um, you need to be able to say, hey Google, to trigger your device. Uh, we need to both detect that hot word and we need to recognize that it's your voice and not somebody else trying to activate your phone. Um, this means uh, because this is running all the time, we have to have a tiny memory and computation footprint running continuously, and we're extremely latency sensitive. As soon as you say the hot word, we need to immediately trigger. Our other major application is on-device speech recognition. Um, we use this often when you're offline or you have a bad network connection. Um, so instead of using the server, we actually run speech recognition on the device. Now this is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Here we're trying to run large models as fast as possible to get the best, passable, best possible accuracy. So it's a high computational load, typically running in a short burst. Um, over the years, uh, we've been working on this for a long time, uh, before there was TensorFlow Lite, before there was TensorFlow. Uh, so we've been investing a lot uh, for a long time in building our own on-device neural net libraries and shipping them to production in Google products for a long time. Um, as a team, we've already invested significantly in keeping our code size tiny, our memory usage small, optimizing our compute for all of these different platforms, uh, and all of our code after many years of production use is really hardened and you know, hopefully as bug-free as you can get it. Um, but over the last year, we decided to migrate to TF Lite. Um, now this wasn't an easy decision for us because our libraries are already so well optimized. Uh, and as we switched over, we checked very carefully to make sure that TF Lite would meet or beat our existing libraries in terms of their size and speed. Uh, and I'm happy to report that over the last year, we've migrated all of the computation we do on CPU for our models to TF Lite. Um, now we're excited about this because this really lays the groundwork for us, moving to a, a new standard that's being widely adopted and we think TF Lite will help us accelerate our models on things like GPUs and edge TPUs, all the new kinds of accelerators uh, that are coming. So thanks, I'll turn it back over to Raziel. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, so Alex highlights two uh, key goals for TensorFlow Lite. So we want to be able to uh, support your current use cases, but uh, perhaps equally important and more important is we want to uh, cater to your needs that you will have, you know, one, two years in the future. Um, so our next presenter is Huji from NetEase. NetEase is a China-based uh, company that has several applications and hundreds of millions of users. So let's welcome him. Thanks, Reza. I'm Hui Jilin from NetEase Youdao. And uh, in Youdao, we have the uh, first leading company in the online education, uh, as well as we have built a lot of dictionary uh, translation and note-taking applications in China. We, has over, we have over 800 million users in total, and we also have uh, 22 million daily active users. In the past years, we have built uh, several dictionary translation and uh, note-taking applications. For example, we have the most popular dictionary application in China, which is Youdao Dictionary. And we also have the uh, most popular translation application in China, which is Youdao Translator. And we also have the most popular uh, dictionary and language learning application in India, which is Yu Dictionary. And in these applications, we provide some features for users to um, uh, conveniently look up words in the uh, scenarios, uh, such as, for example, you can use your camera to uh, recognize the words in, from the images and do the OCR and the translation uh, on your devices. So uh, we use the TensorFlow Lite to accelerate the OCR and translation here. And also, we have, we have provided the uh, photo translation on our, in our applications. For example, we, we, you can use the uh, camera to take a photo from the, from the uh, many scenarios, and uh, it will do the whole image uh, OCR and translate the text uh, 
uh, into another language. And then it will erase the text on the image and replace the te original text uh, to the translated text and uh, then uh, to present users with the translations. And in this scenario, we also use the TensorFlow Lite to uh, accelerate our OCR and translation services here. As we all know that uh, the OCR and the translation, it is very sensitive to the uh, binary size and also uh, computation resources and uh, the uh, responding time. So we uh, choose the ten TensorFlow Lite to accelerate our abilities on device to uh, provide the more, effi more efficient on-device inference here. So that's why we choose the TFLI to do this. Thanks. Thanks, PJ. Um, it's really exciting to see how our infrastructure is used by hundreds of millions of users around the world. And this is something uh, that I wanted to highlight, just like the rest of TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow Lite is geared to not only towards Google, but towards everybody out there. Like Everybody should be able to take advantage of it. Um, okay, so for the rest of the presentation, I will cover uh, what I said at the start, a lot of the, the features that have been made available over the past year and some of our roadmap for this year. Uh, in, in the project, we organize our engineering in four main themes. Uh, the first one is usability. Uh, overall, it means we want to be able to get you up and running as easily and fast as possible. Um, now, that you, once you have your model, uh, basically we want to get you uh, executing that model as fast as possible in the hardware that you care about. Uh, then with optimization, uh, we look at uh, perhaps certain things that we can do to your model to make it even faster and smaller. And finally, uh, with our documentation efforts, we want to give you all the resources that you need so you can get the most out of our infrastructure. So let's start with usability. Um, there is different ways of getting up and running in TensorFlow Lite. Uh, but at the end of the day, you most likely will end up wanting at some point, um, you know, train a model in TensorFlow and convert it to TensorFlow Lite. Uh, the flow is logically very simple, right? You train in TensorFlow, you get a safe model, then you use a TensorFlow Lite converter, and then you get a TensorFlow Lite model that you can now execute on different kinds of devices. However, uh, there is some points of failure. Uh, TensorFlow Lite, uh, uh, we made the, the decision to, be, to take a subset of TensorFlow ops and optimize those. Um, and but that means that basically we don't have all the same hundreds of operations that TensorFlow has. Uh, the other reason is uh, some semantics we don't support yet on TensorFlow Lite, like control flow, which is uh, typically used for recurrent neural networks. But we've made um, already like strides uh, trying to um, basically make this easier and better for you. So last year we launched TensorFlow Select, and uh, this basically means that you can execute TensorFlow ops in TensorFlow Lite. Um, in the pipeline, we're making improvements to TensorFlow Select by enabling selective registration. And I will explain what all this means in the uh, following slides. And we're also working on adding control flow support. Uh, OK, so Select, like I said, it means that you can execute TensorFlow Ops and TensorFlow Lite. It comes at the cost of some binary size increase, um, because right now it's basically all or, all or nothing. But that's why we're building selective registration. Uh, selective registration is already something that you can take advantage of uh, TensorFlow Lite for our, our built-in ops. Uh, so you only include in the binary the ops that you are really using, so you don't end up you know, increasing your binary size unnecessarily. So we're bringing that to TensorFlow Select. And we are also trying to blur the line of what the TensorFlow ops and the TensorFlow Lite ops are. And uh, one of the, the key points of this is blur the performance gap that there might be between one and the other. Uh, now, control flow, again, we're, it's something that we are working on. Um, and this uh, is one of the probably uh, larger pain points where you are trying to convert uh, recurrent neural network to TensorFlow Lite. So this is something that is in progress. So we are adding support for loops and conditionals. And all this is a, a part of a bigger effort to basically revamp entirely our converter. Um, and we, we took your feedback very seriously. 
And we want this converter to answer these three questions, right? If something fails, what went wrong, right? Where it went wrong, and what can you do to, to fix it? Okay, so jumping to the next theme is performance. Uh, we want your models to execute as fast as possible in the hardware that you have available. And if you saw in Megas and Slide, we've made like huge strides in this area, right? So this is an example of a mobile NetV1, uh, you know, the execution in CPU, uh, floating point compared to the, the quantized version in CPU. And now with the recently uh, developer preview that we launched for a CPU, uh, GPU delegate, we get huge gains, right? Like over 7x improvements. And then by using the HTPU delegate, we get like crazy speed ups, right? 62x. Um, so again, we're, this is an area that we're working really hard. Um, again, some, some things that are already available, we have a, a very nice uh, benchmark and profiling tool. And we have a few delegates. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of TensorFlow like delegates, Basically, it's our abstraction layer that allows executing uh, models beyond the CPU, right? So right now we have these three delegates like HTPU, GPU, and the neural network API delegate. And in the pipeline, we are working also on CPU improvements because we know that CPU is important. Um, I'm not listing here in the pipeline anything around newer delegates because it tends to be a partnership um, with other uh, companies and I don't have anything to announce yet but we are um, we're working on that. Okay, our benchmarking tool uh, is basically a, a, a profiler. Um, we added some features to it, it supports multi-threading, uh, you can see uh, statistics per execution, and it supports the neural network API. So when you execute the profiler, you get a lot of information. Um, uh, this is just a snippet of all the stuff that you get, so in this case, we're showing you here uh, information per each one of the ops in your graph, how long it took to execute. Then you also get a nice summary of all the op types in your graph and, and many useful statistics. So you can decide maybe per, there is a way that you can you know, change one op for other type that is more efficient or tweak your graph in some way. Okay, now let's talk about the delegate. So like I said, a delegate is our abstraction layer for executing uh, graphs in different hardware. Um, and the way it works is, mm, is, is very nice because um, basically in the TensorFlow Lite, you prepare a model, right? Uh, you are not necessarily saying this model is for this hardware, you just prepare your model. And then uh, the interpreter will take it and then for those delegates that you register, it will go each, each one by one and then we'll say, okay, how much of this graph can you execute, right? And what the delegate cannot execute, it will be executed in, C in CPU. So by, by doing this, basically, you will always be able to execute, right? And if anything, you will get better performance if the delegate can consume more of your graph. So we have already an HTPU delegate um, HTPUs are Google's uh, ML hardware accelerator for the edge. It's very high performance. It's also very small and, and has a small power footprint. And later on, we'll have more information about the HTPUs and a, and a very cool demo. Uh, the next delegate is the GPU delegate. This is a developer preview right now. Um, and we see very nice performance improvements, right? 2 to 7x compared to floating point in uh, CPU at the cost of a relatively small uh, binary size increase. And how do you enable uh, the GPU delegate? Well, like, just like any other delegate, this is an example of the interpreter and just executing one uh, inference. And the only thing that you need to do to enable, in this case, the GPU delegate, well, you just instantiate it and pass it to the interpreter. And that's it. Uh, so stuff that we're working on for the GPU delegate, well, we want to add more ops. Right now, most of the ops in the GPU delegate are uh, covering convolution networks, but obviously we want to cover you know, recurrent networks, for example. Uh, we want to improve performance even further, and we want to finalize the API, so this is general available, not just a developer PV. Uh, the final delegate that I wanted to mention is the Android Neural Network API, right? So, this will allow you to execute um, any other hardware that the Android and uh, API supports. Um, so it should be just transparent for you. 
Uh, finally, um, CPU is still very important for, for many use cases, right? Like most devices have some form of, of a CPU. So we are targeting further improvements on ARM and x86 uh, architectures. Okay, so the next theme is optimization. So in, in the performance thing, we took a model and we coded it in a way that can execute very fast, right? But maybe we can do tweaks to your model um, to make it even faster or even smaller. Um, so we already did uh, some work here. So last year we released this post-training quantization tool um, that it gives very nice performance improvements on CPU. And this is, this is the first uh, launch that we have in what we are calling Model Optimization Toolkit. So more techniques will be, form, uh, will be part of this toolkit and available for use for, for everybody. And in the pipeline, some of these new techniques that we're going to put in the toolkit is more quantization uh, work. In this case, is what we call fixed point quantization, which gives you further improvements on CPU and allows you to execute in more hardware because a lot of the specialized hardware like neural processing units are just um, fixed point based. There is no floating point support. Um, we're also excited uh, because we're working on a new technique called connection pruning. And I will cover a little bit of all these things next. Uh, so quantization, right, like means just changing the precision of your model and, and how it's executed on the device. We launch a post-training uh, quantization tool where basically you take your, your uh, safe model and when you convert it to TensorFlow Lite format, you can just turn on a flag and it will be quantized. Um, and because it's on CPU, basically we can do a mix of fixed point and floating point math, to try to get the most performance and relatively uh, small accuracy loss. And we see very nice improvements this way. Uh, if, the, if the model gets fully quantized, then you get 4x uh, you know, compression. And for convolutional models, we see 10 to 50% um, performance improvement. Uh, but for fully connected and RNS, we see up to 3x. So uh, again, this is something that is extremely simple to try, right? Like, um, if you already are using TensorFlow Lite or plan to use it, just give this a try. Uh, obviously, you have to uh, validate how the accuracy is affected in your particular model, but so far we've seen very good numbers. And, and many of the two billion devices that, that we mentioned before are running this way. In the pipeline, um, again, we're, we're making further improvements in the uh, quantization uh, approaches that we have. So we're working now on this fixed point quantization. And we want to make it both powerful by enabling quantized training and also very easy to use. And that's why we're also bringing more post-training quantization support. So this is an example of a Keras model, right? It's very easy. You have used two dense layers. And now let's say that you want to Train with quantization and do those two dense layers. Well, in soon enough, uh, you will be able to just import our API and just say quantize those two dense layers. And the post-training quantization will work uh, just like the, uh, for fixed point will work uh, very much like the one that we already support, where you have the, the conversion path, and the only thing that you need to pass extra is some calibration data. And calibration data is just the, the typical data that your model sees as the input. So for example, if you have an input, uh, uh, an image processing model, you just need to pass uh, some images. And, and you don't really need to pass a ton of images. So in preliminary numbers, for example, for mobile nets, we see with 25 images, we do very well. These are some of the numbers, again, preliminary numbers that we see with this tool. Uh, we have the float baseline, right? And then if you do quantized training, then you get uh, almost the same accuracy with all the benefits of quantization, of compression and fast execution. And then even, even further, if you really, uh, you know, for some reason you don't want to invest in quantized training or perhaps you just have a model you know, that, that you got somewhere, you can still quantize it with post-training quantization. And you see there that basically the, the, the accuracy is almost the same. The other technique that we are uh, heavily investing in right now is connection pruning. Uh, what this means is that uh, at training time, we just prune connections in the, in the network. The prune connections become zeros, and that creates just a sparse tensor. 
the nice benefits of our sparse tensors is that you can um, you know, compress them because you can skip the zeros and you can create potentially faster models if you have uh, right, like less computations to do. So coming very soon, we're going to add a training time um, pruning, uh, again, as a, as a Keras-based API. And in the pipeline, we're working on uh, first-class support of sparse execution and TensorFlow Lite. So again, in our example from Keras, this, uh, you have your two dense layers. You want to prune connections into the, into the, uh, from those two layers. And then the only thing that you need to do is just say prune. Uh, so it's very, very simple. Uh, at that point, um, when you convert the model to TensorFlow Lite format, um, uh, basically by just even zipping the file, you will get the nice compressions. And these are some, uh, again, very preliminary numbers. Uh, in this case, a mobile net, which actually is pretty hard to prune compared to other perhaps larger models, but we see very small losses at 50% and even 75%. Finally, documentation, well, um, again, we want to give you all the resources that you need uh, to, to get the most out of TensorFlow Lite. Um, and we have already done uh, pretty nice improvements. We have a new site, right, that is not only just pretty, but it has more content. We currently have a model repository with five models and applications that you can try. Um, but we want to work, and we are working on more tutorials, and, and we're also trying to expand our repository. So. This is how the new site looks, if you haven't taken a look. Uh, the goal is, again, not only that it's pretty, but that it answers your questions. Um, so please give us some more feedback if there is you know, things that are still lacking there. Um, yeah, so we remember the documentation. And very important, we also have uh, there the, the roadmap for the foreseeable future. So a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about now, you can see it there um, in more detail, perhaps. And then again, we have a repository with all these applications and tutorials, and we are expanding it. We want to, we want to make the repository into something that, you know, if, if you don't want to go, uh, or before you start trying to train something, perhaps we already have a model that you can reuse. Uh, by the way, yeah, TensorFlow uh, Mobile is deprecated, right? Es especially with the work that we did to bring TensorFlow Select, which allows you to execute uh, TensorFlow Ops in TensorFlow Lite, uh, there is no need for TensorFlow Mobile, uh, except if you are doing training on device. So that is the, the reason why we're keeping that there. But um, yeah, training. Um, so if you see, we're building a lot of um, the basic infrastructure that um, you will need when you are trying to prepare a training pipeline to, to execute on device. Um, I don't have anything to announce now, but I just wanted to let you know that we're working on it and thinking a lot about it. Uh, what about TensorFlow 2.0? Well, uh, it just uh, should work. <laughs> if you have a safe model, you should be able to uh, convert it to TensorFlow Lite. And before we go, uh, Two last things. Uh, one is uh, there was a lot of content in this talk. Uh, tomorrow we have some breakout sessions where we're going to cover uh, TensorFlow Lite in general and uh, optimization in particular. Um, and also I want to introduce Pete Warden, who is uh, going to talk about some very cool project. Awesome. <laughs> so thanks so much, Raziel. Um, and I'm really excited to be here um, to talk about a new project uh, that I think is uh, pretty cool. Um, so TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, what's that all about? Um, <laughs> so this all comes back to when I actually first joined Google back in 2014. And as you can imagine, there were a whole bunch of internal projects that I didn't actually know about as a member of the public that sort of blew my mind. But one in particular came about when I actually spoke to Raziel for the first time. And he explained, um, and he was on the speech team at the time working with uh, Alex, who you just saw. Um, and he explained that they used neural network models that were only 13 kilobytes in size. Um, at that time, I only really had experience with image networks. And the very smallest of them was still like multiple megabytes. So this idea of having a 13 kilobyte model was just um, amazing for me. 
Um, and what amazed me even more was when he told me why these models had to be so small. Um, they were running them, they needed to run them on these DSPs and other embedded chips in smartphones so Android could listen out for wake words like, hey Google, while the main CPU was uh, powered off to save the battery. Um, these microcontrollers often only had tens of kilobytes of RAM and flash storage, um, so they simply couldn't fit anything larger. Um, they also couldn't rely on cloud connectivity because the amount of power that would have been drained just keeping a radio connection alive to send data over would have just been uh, prohibitive. So that really uh, struck me, that conversation and the continued work um, that we did with the speech team because they had so much experience doing all sorts of uh, different approaches with speech. Uh, they'd spent a lot of time and a lot of energy experimenting. And even within the tough constraints of these embedded devices, uh, neural networks were better than any of the traditional methods they used. Um, so I was left wondering if they'd be really useful for other embedded sensor applications as well. And it left me really wanting to see if we could actually build support for these kind of devices into TensorFlow itself um, so that uh, more people could actually get access to it. At the time, only people in the speech community really knew about the groundbreaking work that was being done. So I really wanted to share it a lot more widely. So, <laughs> uh, today um, I'm pleased to announce that we are releasing the first experimental support for embedded platforms in TensorFlow Lite. And to show you what I mean, here is a uh, demonstration board uh, that I actually uh, have in my pocket. Um, and this is a prototype of a development board built by SparkFun, and it has a Cortex M4 processor um, with 384 kilobytes of RAM and a whole megabyte of flash storage. Um, and it was built by Ambic to be extremely low power, drawing less than one milliwatt in um, a lot of cases. So it's able to run on a single coin battery like this um, for uh, many days, potentially. Um, and I'm actually going to take my life in my hands now uh, by trying a live demo. Um, <laughs> so let us, let us see if this is actually... Um, it's going to be extremely hard to see unless we dim the lights. There we go. Um, so what I'm going to be doing here is by saying a particular word um, and see if it actually lights up the uh, little yellow light. You can see the blue LED is flashing. That's just telling me that it's running inference. So if I try saying yes, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I knew I was taking my life into my hands here. Yes. There we go. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly move that out of the spotlight there. <laughs> so um, as you can see, it's still far from perfect. <laughs> but it is managing to do a, a job of recognizing when I say the word and not lighting up when there's unrelated conversations. Um, so. Why is this useful? Well, first, this is running entirely locally on the embedded chip. So we don't need to have any internet connection. Um, so it's a good, useful first component of a voice interface system. And the model itself um, isn't quite 13 kilobytes, but it is down to 20 kilobytes. Um, so it only takes up 20 kilobytes of flash storage on this device. And the footprint of the TensorFlow light code for microcontrollers is only another 25 kilobytes. Um, and it only needs about 30 kilobytes of RAM available to operate. So it's within the capabilities of a lot of different embedded devices. Um, secondly, um, this is all open source. Um, so you can actually grab the um, code yourself and build it yourself. Um, and you can modify it, you can actually, I'm showing you here on this particular platform, but it, it actually works on a whole bunch of different uh, embedded chips, and we really want to see um, lots more uh, supported, so we're keen to work with the community 
on collaborating uh, to get more um, devices supported. Um, you can also train your own model. Um, just something that recognizes yes isn't all that useful, but <laughs> the key thing is that this comes with um, a tutorial that you can use to actually um, train your own models, and it also comes with a data set of 100,000 utterances um, of about 20 common words that you use as your training set. And that first link there, the AIY Projects one, um, if you could actually go to that link and contribute your voice to the open data set, um, it should actually increase um, the size and the quality of the data set that we can actually make available. So that would be awesome. And you can actually use the same approach to do a lot of different audio recognition to recognize different kinds of sounds and even start to use it for similar signal processing problems like, uh, you know, things like predictive maintenance. So, how can you try this out for yourself? Um, if you're in the audience here, um, at the end of today, uh, you will find that you get a gift box and you actually have one of these in there. Uh, <laughs> and all you should need to do is remove uh, the little uh, tab between the battery and it should automatically boot up pre-flashed with this uh, yes example. Uh, <laughs> so you can try it out for yourself and let me know how it goes. Just say, say yes to TensorFlow I liked as the... Uh, <laughs> Um, and we also include all the cables, so you should be able to just program it yourself uh, through the serial port. Uh, now, these are the first 700 boards ever built, um, so there is a wiring issue, uh, so it will drain the battery. It won't last, it will last more like hours than days, um, but uh, that will actually, uh, knock on wood, be fixed in the uh, <laughs> final product that's shipping. Um, and you should be able to develop with these in the exact same way that you will with the uh, final shipping product. Um, and if you're watching at home, uh, you can order, pre-order one of these from uh, SparkFun uh, right now for, I think it's $15. Um, and you'll also find lots of other um, instructions for other platforms in the documentation. Um, so we are trying to support all of the, or as many of the, um, modern microcontrollers that are out there that people are using as possible. Um, and we welcome collaboration with everybody across the community to um, help unlock all of the creativity that I know is out there. Um, and I'm really hoping that I'm gonna be spending a lot of my time over the next few months uh, reviewing pull requests. Um, <laughs> and finally, um, this was my first hardware project, so I needed a lot of help <laughs> from a lot of people uh, to actually um, help bring this prototype together, including the TF Lite team, especially Raziel, um, Rocky, Dan, Tim, and Andy, um, Alistair, um, Nathan, uh, Owen, and Jim at SparkFun were lifesavers. Uh, we literally got these in our hands middle of the day yesterday. <laughs> so the fact that they managed to pull it together is a massive tribute. Um, and also Scott, uh, Steve, Arpit, and Andre at Ambic, um, who actually designed this process and helped us get the software going. And actually a lot of people at ARM as well, including a big shout out to Neil and Zach. Uh, so this is a, still a very early experiment, um, but I really can't wait to see what people build with this. Um, and one final note, um, I will be around uh, to talk about MCUs with anybody who's interested at the breakout session on day two. Um, so I'm really looking forward to chatting to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Uh, we really hope that you try this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's early stages, but you see a huge effort uh, just to make this happen. I think we, we think that it will be really impactful for everybody. Um, now, before we go again, and I promise this is the last thing you hear from me, um, I want to welcome uh, June, um, who's going to uh, talk about how by using TensorFlow Lite with the HTPU delegate are able to train these teachable machines. Thanks, Raziel. 
Hi, my name is Jun Tate Gans. Uh, I'm actually one of the lead software engineers inside of Google's new Coral Group, uh, and I've been asked to give a talk about the Edge TPU based Teachable Machine demo. So, first, I should tell you what Coral is. Coral is a platform for products with on device machine learning using TensorFlow and TF Lite. Our first two products are a single board computer and a USB stick. So, what is the Edge TPU? It's a Google-designed ASIC that accelerates inference directly on the device that it's embedded in. It's very fast, localizes data to the edge rather than the cloud, doesn't require a network connection to run, and this allows for a whole new range of applications of machine learning. So the first product we built is the Coral Dev Board. Now this runs, uh, this is a single board computer with a removable SOM. It runs Linux and Android, and the SOM itself has a gigabyte of RAM, a quad-core A53 SOC, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and of course, the Edge TPU. Now the second is our Coral Accelerator board. Now this board is just the Edge TPU connected via USB-C to whatever development system you need, be it a Raspberry Pi or a Linux workstation. Now this teachable machine shows off a form of edge training. Now, traditionally, there's three ways to do edge training. There's k-nearest k neighbors, weight imprinting, and last layer retraining. But for this demo, we're actually using the k-nearest neighbors approach. So in this animated GIF, you can see that the TPU enables very high classification rates. The frame rate you see here is actually the rate at which the TPU is classifying the images that I'm showing it. Uh, in this case, you can see that we're getting about 30 frames per second. It's essentially real-time classification. And with that, I actually have one of the, our Teachable Machine demos here. So if we can turn this on. There we go. Okay. So on this board, uh, we have our uh, HTPU development board uh, assembled with a camera and a series of buttons. Now, each button corresponds with a class and lights up when the model identifies an object from the camera. Well, first, we have to plug this in. Now, every time I take a picture uh, by pressing one of these buttons, it associates that picture with that particular class. And because it's running inference on the Edge TPU, it lights up immediately. So once it's finished booting, the first thing I have to do is train it on the background. So I'll press this blue button, and you can see it immediately turns on. This is because, again, it's doing inference in real time. Now, if I train one of the other buttons using something like a tangerine, press it a few times. OK, so now you can see it can classify between this tangerine and the background. And further, I can even grab other objects such as this TF light sticker. It looks very similar, right? It's the same color. So let's see, what was, it? What was the class I used? Yellow, OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so now, even though it's a similar color, it can still discern the TensorFlow light uh, logo from the tangerine. Oh, sorry. Tangerine. There we go. <laughs> So you can imagine, in a manufacturing context, your operators with no knowledge of machine learning or training in machine learning can adapt your system easily and quickly using this exact technique. So that's about it for the demo. Uh, but before I go, I should grab the clicker. And also, I should say, we're also giving away some Edge TPU accelerators. For those of you here today, we'll have one available for you as well. And for those of you on the live stream, you can purchase one at, at coral.withgoogle.com. Okay.